in progress. Okay, welcome everyone. I am so excited that you have joined us tonight. Uh, my name is Ann Bennett. I am the executive director of the Laurel Historical Society here in Laurel, Maryland. And if you have not come to the museum or are familiar with us, then I um, just want to give a brief introduction. We are a small community museum and archive located at 817 Main Street in Laurel, Maryland. Uh, and we're at one end of Main Street and at the very far end of Main Street from the museum is the Crystal Fox. And I am joined tonight by Sterling Foxmore, uh, who is the owner. Uh, so just another few words of housekeeping. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, as you just heard, and we encourage you to put any comments or questions either in the chat box or use the Q&A function. And we'll do our best to answer questions as they come up or at the end of the lecture. Uh, so tonight we're going to go through a brief history of Halloween and look at the evolution of the holiday, uh, kind of doing a social history of Halloween, uh, in addition to taking a look at some of our favorite traditions in modern America. And we're really just scratching the surface. We're going to go through things pretty quickly tonight. So feel free to add any stories, comments, references, or anything like that into the chat. So bear with me for just one second. I am going to share my screen so we can all see the presentation. Okay, so can everyone, everyone see that? I can. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Sterling. Okay. So what we are, again, talking about tonight is Halloween in modern America and how we kind of celebrate it. To me, Halloween is a fun and fascinating holiday to study because in many ways, Halloween is unique among the holidays we celebrate in modern America. And if you think of our traditional calendar, we have a mix of patriotic holidays, of religious or ethnic celebrations. And Halloween is similar to holidays like Easter and Christmas that have a mix of Christian and non-Christian or pagan traditions. But it's also really kind of demonized or maligned uh, as well, because it has such ancient roots in these, you know, very, very old pre-Christian uh, traditions. And it's kind of, you know, macabre, you know, we're talking about celebrations of life and death. And what I think, though, is the most fascinating aspect of Halloween is that it is the most changing and fastest growing, really, of all the holidays. And it's Accumulate, accumulating all of these traditions from different time periods and different cultures, and it's still evolving, it's still spreading out, and it's becoming a phenomena in parts of the world where there isn't uh, a connection or a historical or cultural connection. You can find Halloween celebrations in Africa and parts of the Middle East even and in Asia. And what I think is gonna be kind of the next step in our stage of development is there really is gonna be a big mix of incorporating related but independent celebrations like the Day of the Dead. So I feel like that's going to be the next stage in our evolution of Halloween. And so when we talk about then the history of Halloween, we're asking ourselves, where do our modern American Halloween traditions come from? And like I said, they're really a mix of different traditions, different celebrations, and they've been evolving really for thousands of years. And in some cases, the practices are really unrecognizable from what they were even two or three generations ago. Uh, if you think back to your own childhood or to your parents or grandparents' generation, Halloween then is very different than Halloween was now. And if we set that timeline back centuries or even uh, millennia, uh, it's going to be very, very changed over time. So we're really looking at kind of the evolution of Halloween, how it gets down to us in America today through the blending of Celtic traditions, Roman traditions, and then Christian festivals and celebrations. 
And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the ancient traditions of the, the Celts. And then I'm going to uh, talk about the, the modern practices today. And I'm going to let Sterling kind of jump in and to have his take on it and how he helps uh, his customers uh, with the offerings from his store. But when we really talk about where do our modern American Halloween traditions come from, we have to start with the British Isles and Celtic traditions in, in particular. And we're talking about the festival of Samhain, or you might hear it Samhain. And it's really the ancient pagan festival celebrating the Celtic New Year, which occurred at the end of the harvest season before uh, the winter. So it was this transition period and it means summer's end. So you're really looking at it as uh, a new year. So how we in America would celebrate December 31st as New Year's Eve, it really has that mindset of this transition from harvest to winter at the midpoint between the fall equinox and the winter solstice. And if you think about it, if you look out your window, this is the same time of year as what we're dealing with now. So the crops have been gathered in, animals would have been slaughtered, preparations for winter were completed, and there was a dormancy in, in the natural world around us then and now, and it, was, it led us humans to a greater awareness and appreciation of death and mortality uh, and kind of the cyclical nature of life and death and the seasons. So with this transition uh, between fall and harvest and winter and dormancy came a shift in the energy of the earth. And it was believed that the veil between the worlds of the living and the dead would be at its weakest point in the entire year. And this enabled the dead to cross over. And this kind of took a couple of different forms. So the people who had previously passed away could return to the land of the living to visit their relatives. And the people who had passed away within that previous year, because again, we're celebrating a new year, they would go to the world of the dead. So we have this crossover kind of happening both ways. And bonfires were lit all through the towns and villages and countrysides, both as a way to light the way to guide the spirits to where they need to go, and also to scare away the evil spirits who were not where they should be and were doing things that they shouldn't be. Uh, crops, animals were also sacrificed to help with this crossover, this in between worlds. So, because this veil is shifting um, and kind of lowered in between the seasonal change, there was a real fear then of these deceased people, these spirits um, being evil or being malicious. So we have a lot of fear or superstitions to protect the living and ward off the dead and the evil uh, spirits. So that's why bonfires were also built, not only to light the way for the, um, dead to cross over, but also to scare evil spirits away. In the same th way of thinking, bells were also rung to keep them away. For the living, masks were also worn to disguise themselves so they wouldn't be recognized by the evil spirits. And one aspect also that was uh, undertaken was that the living would host what's called a dumb supper, dumb as in mute, not speaking, where the family would sit down and there would be a place set for uh, the spirits who had passed over and no one would speak, but it was an invitation to have the spirits join you. Uh, and so we get parts of that uh, today in our modern celebrations of Samhain. So Sterling, I am going to invite you to talk if you want to. Uh, on the topics of modern practices of Samhain. And then I could wrap up this slide if you wanted and we can move on to the rest of our evolution. Uh, I think you did a fantastic job. Um, you said many things that I would have mentioned. Uh, it is an end of the sort of the goddess time of the year. And it's a time where we rely on the God. So where summer, uh, was agrarian, 
uh, and we relied on our crops in green growing things of the earth gathering. Uh, in the winter, we would rely on uh, the men of the tribe to hunt. And uh, so you may have references to uh, the great hunt or the wild hunt. Um, so it is a time of transition. Um, it is a time when you knew how much food you had and how many animals you could feed for the winter. Um, so you may have, um, we may have just come from the harvest moon and now we might be rolling towards um, what they might call the blood moon. So if you could only feed so many chickens or so many cows through the winter, you had to uh, slaughter the ones you couldn't feed and then uh, hopefully salt and store the meat um, or have a, have a feast. So uh, it was definitely that time. It was a time to honor those who have passed. And uh, in the modern uh, days, we certainly honor those that have passed. A lot of folks may have a lot of uh, relatives or friends that may have transitioned this year. And it's a time to remember them. So sometimes we'll put their picture on our uh, hearth or on a place where we might have our, our candles. Uh, so I just want to mention that. Otherwise, we can move on. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for that. And I'm just kind of curious, you know, have you seen kind of um, like a growth, you know, with the response to the pandemic? Has this kind of this personal devotion or this, you know, connection to people who have passed on, you know, has that kind of come more to the forefront? Have you been seeing that? I think that um, people were probably more used to getting together in person, although I think this year some some folks did get together in person outdoors. There's a lot more Zoom this year. There's a lot more meetings that are, are virtual. Um, in some ways, um, we're lucky that we are still very connected. And uh, in, in other ways, we suffer that lack of human connection that we may have when we're in person with people. Um, so, hard in that sense. So hard to worship as we normally would, but um, it's a good time for uh, introspection, although maybe we've had too much of that and we want to be outside and we want to be connected. It's a good time to uh, connect with nature. Um, the heat isn't too bad and it's not too cold. It is perhaps a uh, an excellent time to uh, connect to the earth. Well, I think that's great, Sterling. Thank you. And yeah, it's kind of following just the natural cycle of things. Like we said, you know, it's kind of this transition between, you know, what was living and, and green and lush in the spring and summer and transitioning to the harvest. So it really kind of is a natural time of new beginnings. And, you know, similar to what we do on New Year's Eve with setting intentions and resolutions for the coming year, we also tend to reflect on the year before. And so that's essentially what's happening, you know, at this time of the year, this transition. Yeah, exactly. Wonderful. Um, well, I am going to go on. And again, if you have any questions for Sterling, you can certainly put those in the chat or Q&A as we go along. But I'll move along with our evolution of Halloween. And what we're talking about next is uh, Roman traditions. So when the Romans invaded the British Isles, they really brought with them their own feasts and their own way of doing things uh, and their own festivities. And what we had heard for, for decades, for centuries in early history was this idea that the goddess of the harvest was Pomona and her symbol was the apple. So that's where a lot of languages gets uh, the word apple from, palm. 
Uh, but it really wasn't uh, a Roman festival. Pomona is actually a minor goddess, and it was only in later centuries, especially during the Romantic Age, where she was commemorated in poetry, and that led later historians uh, and critics to overlap with her attributions with the fall harvest. But the bigger celebration was actually this nine-day festival called uh, Parental and this was the Roman commemoration of the dead. It took place not at the harvest time, but in February. And this was a private celebration for deceased family members. But on the last day of the festival, Feralia, it was a public ceremony. So that's when you would have people going to visit tombs and bringing earthly goods as offerings. So they would bring grain or salt or bread soaked with wine to the tombs of their deceased loved ones. And it really was a time of uh, death and mourning. And so there weren't any public uh, worships or festivals going on uh, and no weddings were allowed to take place. And then that Charistia is the feast day immediately after the nine day celebration. And this is a day of happiness. It's a day of love to celebrate your living family and friends uh, with banquets and feasts and gifts. So it's really nice to kind of have that, again, that cycle of life and death that after you go through this festival of mourning, you look kind of you know to the land of the living and, and to the love that you have with your family and so that's the roman traditions that are mixing up uh with the celtic traditions uh, and kind of you know uh, evolving over those centuries uh, in the british isles and then really the kind of the biggest factor uh, to really bring uh, Halloween to the forefront uh, is Christianity. And so Christians uh, actually celebrated All Saints Day on May 13th uh, and as a way to honor the saintly departed, the people who had died and attained sainthood. But in the eighth century, the feast was moved to November 1st where it's still celebrated today as a way to synchronize with the non-Christian or the pagan traditions such as Samhain, which was on the same day and the evening festivals uh, began the night before. Uh, so All Saints, Hallows, Hallowed, Saintly People, uh, it was known kind of as the same terminology. So October 31st then was All Hallows Evening, which was shortened to Halloween. So that's sometimes why you see an apostrophe in between the double E's uh, in order um, references to Halloween. And November 2nd, you know, kind of similar to that uh, day after a day of mourning uh, is All Souls Day, which is a time to pray for all of the departed, all of the dead, uh, but especially the ones who might be in purgatory, uh, not just the people who have gone uh, to heaven. After the Reformation in the 16th century, much of the religious connotation is removed from celebrations, except for uh, among Catholics and uh, areas and communities that were heavily Catholic in the British Isles. Uh, and today, uh, we still celebrate that on November 1st and November 2nd. And so that, uh, that evolution is a really quick run through of the blending of all of these traditions. And as Sterling pointed out, there's still a lot of commonality that we have over these decades and centuries and millennia of traditions. Uh, and so as I went through a little quickly, the brief history of this evolution, there were probably things that stood out to you as recognizable uh, or some roots in our modern traditions. So what we're looking at now is what are some of the common modern elements of Halloween? And there's actually quite a bit, a lot of iconography and pop culture references that I'm not going to be able to get into. But I thought we'd talk about kind of some of the things that pop to mind immediately when you hear Halloween, and that is candy, costumes, putting the two together, you get trick-or-treating. And then also uh, jack-o'-lanterns and pumpkin carving. So uh, we're going to be kind of moving through those as well. So as we heard about the evolution from Celtic traditions to incorporation of Roman traditions to Christian traditions, uh, we also have that big melting point pot of traditions moving 
across the Atlantic Ocean uh, to America. And this is really beginning in the 1840s when people from Ireland in particular following the potato famine, but the British Isles in general, began migrating in mass numbers. And they brought with them their Halloween traditions, their superstitions, their legends. Uh, and so we really kind of have a lot of this mixing uh, and modernizing and adapting to American, uh, you know, American soil and what was available in America. So we're gonna talk about candy. <laughs> and I am going to see if I can try to launch a poll here because uh, I do have a quiz here for you. Um, two questions. So how much money do Americans spend on Halloween candy each year? Uh, and this is a generalization, you know, roughly the last, you know, two or three years. We're talking like 2019, 2020, that kind of thing. And then I'm also curious about the candy corn debate. So take another couple of seconds. And Sterling, you can vote too, so. I did. I was wondering if it was uh, counting the spending from my family household on Halloween candy. Exactly. Okay, so I'll give another couple of seconds here and then I'll end the poll. Okay, and then I'm gonna share the results. Um, I'm not sure what you're seeing right now, but you should see the results for both of the questions. So we have, again, how much money do Americans spend on Halloween candy each year, all the way up from 100 million to 10 billion. Uh, and the answer is it's getting very close to 3 billion. Ooh. which is kind of surprising yeah uh it's been creeping up every year and so this is all the amount of money that people spend to give out on you know for trick-or-treating for um you know businesses for charities for all that kind of thing uh yeah and uh, like one of the comments said it's you know around twenty dollars or even above uh on average for a household uh, but on the flip side of that, there is uh, a lot of waste as well. So a lot of the candy that is bought doesn't get eaten or it sits around forever. That's not a problem in my household, but in other places, <laughs> it might go to waste. And then I'm really kind of happy about the candy corn question. Uh, it looked like yum, which was my vote. I uh, just kind of eked out as the winner, but it looks like it's kind of divided between eh or yuck or yum. So thank you for taking um, taking uh, part in that poll. <laughs> and so it is, it's about 3 billion every year on candy, but going back hundreds of years, it wouldn't have been candy corn or anything wrapped from the store. Um, so where it really came from was this tradition of souling. And what would happen is people would go door to door offering to say prayers for your deceased loved ones in exchange for food. Uh, and the food they were given were called soul cakes, which is that picture you kind of see on your right, which are really just kind of small scone-like cakes of spices and dried fruit. So when people would go a souling, they would go and they would say prayers in exchange for, for food. Um, if you were, you know, my age or a little bit older, you probably got candy apples for treats or popcorn balls for treats. Um, and so we, again, see that connection or that kind of false connection between Pomona and apples, apple bobbing at this time of the year, because apples, again, are such a big uh, symbol of the harvest. We really have this connection between apples as a prize or you know something as some type of reward, uh, but it's also uh, connected to fortune telling, which, as we heard from Celtic traditions, uh, is really a big part of the Samhain uh, festival. So apple bobbing evolved out of these fortune telling practices as kind of like a parlor game. And what would happen is a couple of things that the first girl to successfully uh, get an apple from bobbing uh, would be the first to marry in the coming year. Uh, other traditions would be as if you peeled an apple uh, in one long curl and threw it over your shoulder, whatever shape that the apple peel took would be the initials of the person that you were going to marry again in the new year. So there's a little bit of, you know, that overlap between apples going door to door uh, and getting, uh, you know, something delicious or, um, you know, a reward in return. 
And we also have our modern uh, thing take on costumings and dressing up, but costumes and dressing up, disguises, masks, uh, are nothing unique to Halloween. These elements have been part of festival celebrations and playing make-believe and pretend for, for centuries across many different ethnicities and cultures. And it really is not unique to Halloween. And our kind of tradition of disguising ourselves comes from this ancient tra tradition of mumming or in Scotland called guising. And as you can see in some of these uh, pictures, the historical picture, particularly on the left, it came from this kind of creepy <laughs> tradition of people uh, covering themselves with a mask or some cloth and going door to door, dropping in on people's houses to play games that were rigged, like uh, rolling um, weighted dice and gambling with people, and they wouldn't talk. So it kind of does harken back to that dumb supper in a way where you know there's that element of silence. Um, but this, again, was not just a unique Halloween tradition. This was actually um, much more common in Tudor times around Christmas or Twelfth Night. There's this kind of tradition of mumming. And if you're from Philadelphia or from the Philadelphia area, you know, the big Mummer's Day parade is you know, kind of at that uh, same time of the year as well. And so we kind of get that tradition as well. And there was a comment about Carnival as well. And yes, it was this idea of kind of the anonymity that masks give you it was a way to you know protect yourself ward away evil spirits but engage and some of the mischief that this this anonymity uh allowed you uh to, to engage in things that you wouldn't normally do especially if you were in smaller villages where people knew everyone else and yes the costumes or the masks again were a, a protection really so that you couldn't um be pranked you couldn't um you know be taken away by the evil spirits or anything like that uh, and i just want to also throw in two pop culture references uh if anyone is familiar with the movie uh, meet me in saint louis does anyone like that movie has anyone uh, watched it before you probably might be surprised to learn that um, as famous as it is for things like the trolley song and one of my favorite Christmas carols, um, you know, have yourself a merry little Christmas. It has an almost 10 minute segment on Halloween. And even though it was uh, filmed in 1944, it was set in 1903, 1904 during the St. Louis World Fair. And so what's fascinating to me is that this is still in living memory to people. They're only about a generation, generation and a half removed from that time period in the 40s. And so what we're looking at is an extended view of Halloween practices at the turn of the century. Some of it is a little idealized because it's Hollywood, but it's still fairly accurate for Halloween at the time. So as you can see, the two youngest daughters, they have costumes uh, and they are in ghost costumes. One calls herself a horrible ghost. The other one calls herself a terrible drunken ghost. And they do go out in the neighborhood, but they're not getting candy and they're not trick or treating. Uh, they are going around to quote, kill people, which is, uh, throwing a handful of flour into people's faces. And that's how you would kind of make mischief. Um, there are bonfires in the movie. Uh, there's a scarecrow. Uh, so there's still modern elements, but it's not trick-or-treating as we know it. Uh, and if you haven't watched the movie, go back. You can find it on YouTube there. Uh, it's kind of a really fun, surprising kind of documentation of that early Halloween celebration. And then in the 1960s, I'm sure everyone has probably seen It's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown. And even in this little snippet, you can see a lot of the overlap between the earlier practices, like the apple bobbing and the masks. Uh, but you can also see some evolution of our more modern practices with all the streamers and the decorations and just having a really fun time among children uh, in it. So this was done in 19, uh, 1966. 
uh, as a way, again, to popularize the idea of candy and costumes uh, and you know, just people dressing up and having more merriment at this time. And then when we put it both together, we get trick or treating, which is probably what you think of when we talk about uh, Halloween. Uh, and so there's a lot, um, a lot of different elements coming into trick or treating. So we just talked about the candy and the costumes, that kind of anonymity, that sense of mischief that's kind of behind everything. And again, this idea of trick or treating is thought to come from British and Irish traditions, largely in areas again that were Catholic or had a, a Catholic majority uh, that still ce celebrated All Saints Day and All Souls Day. However, we have among the Protestant denomination, we have the celebration of Guy Fawkes Day on November 5th, which was um, the commemoration of the failed gunpowder plot in 1605, which was a Catholic conspiracy to blow up the House of Parliament. Uh, it failed and uh, Guy Fawkes, the leader of the conspirators, uh, was you know, was hanged and tried and uh, ever since then, and still in modern Britain, it's a, a popular holiday. And throughout, you know, the succeeding centuries, it was kind of a day, you know, of celebration in kind of triumph of this failure uh, to blow up Parliament. And one part of that was, again, dressing up in this, or at least an anonymous kind of cloth and masks, and parading through the streets with an effigy of Guy Fawkes. But toward the middle of the 19th century, you see fewer and fewer adults doing that, and you see the progression of kids doing it, again, with effigies, but kind of just roaming the neighborhoods among gangs of kids and just kind of going out to celebrate something that was kind of sanctioned by adults because that was the general nature of the celebration, uh, but still kind of, you know, making it more of a, of a child celebration with their own little group of kids doing it. And again, we said that trick-or-treating, that idea of door-to-door -door, comes from souling. And what we see now happening is people are not asking for prayers uh, going door-to-door, -door, but that idea of you know, prayers being replaced with the threat of pranks. So that, again, that trick or treat come, coming in. So people are not offering to pray anymore. They're offering mischief, uh, or the threat of mischief, at least, uh, if they don't get some candy. And so this really becomes, let me see if I, here we go. So trick or treating uh, really becomes more popular after the turn of the 20th century. So by the 1920s, we actually see the term trick or treat in print sources. And in 1914, a woman named Elizabeth Krebs uh, real, you know, was concerned about the growing um, pranks and mischief and how it was really getting uh, out of control. Uh, we, there's a comment again about uh, mischief nights uh, in parts of the country, even not too long ago, uh, the night before was called Hell Night, I believe. So there was a really sense of just kind of out of control, more mean spirited pranks. So a little bit of the eggs and toilet papering of houses, but more things like burning property um, and accosting people and things like that. And so Elizabeth Krebs uh, in 1914 organized really the first Halloween parade. Uh, so there was kind of this idea of trying to create family friendly events and kind of do a more of a controlled trick or treat uh, to encourage people to, to make those connections again. And so this is where we see instead of getting a soul cake, we get cookies and apples and popcorn balls um, or maybe a small toy or uh, a coin, but not the soul cakes. And then after the Second World War, we get the rise of candy manufacturers coming to dominate uh, the candy industry. And so uh, again, if it's not Hershey at this point, you know, then what's the point of trick or treating? So that's where we get the fade, uh, fade out of the homemade goodies. Because again, um, it's children going door to door 
without adult supervision, uh, getting candy from strangers. And at some point we kind of recognized that was a little weird and creepy. So there's a way to kind of control that and buying prepackaged um, candy was one of the ways to do that. But again, it was, it was really kind of unknown and tumultuous and had this bad reputation again of mischief for a long while. And it wasn't until this mid-century period, the 30s, uh, sorry, the 40s, 50s, and into the 60s that we see kind of the rise of the pop culture phenomenon that kind of, you know, made it safer. Uh, so we have uh, in 1944, the movie Arsenic and Old Lace. I don't know if we have, again, any old movie fans <laughs> in the audience, um, but they, it, Arsenic and Old Lace came out in the same year as Meet Me in St. Louis, 1944, although it was shot during the war in 1942. It was a film directed by Frank Capra, starring Cary Grant, and it's a dark comedy. It was based on a play, uh, which was in turn based on a real life story of a serial killer. <laughs> and uh, it's kind of very um, tied up with Halloween. There's Halloween and its opening credits. There's iconography of black cats and witches and pumpkins. And what we think, uh, researchers think, is the very first appearance of trick-or-treating captured in film, uh, kind of a modern day celebration of it. Again, Meet Me in St. Louis was a throwback to the turn of the century. This was kind of contemporary with um, the making of the movies in, in the mid 40s here. So, and you can kind of see a screenshot of that. So you can kind of see some rubbery type mats. You see the jack-o'-lantern uh, offerings of candy, that kind of thing coming out of it. Uh, we already talked about um, Charlie Brown, but even before they came out as it's the great pumpkin Charlie Brown, it was in the Peanuts comic strip about 15 years uh, before that. And so you can see in the upper right, it's a three panel run leading up to Halloween. And it's documenting all of these things that we are coming to understand about Halloween. It's got the costumes, uh, the trick or treating, the door to door, the masks, uh, and the carving of the jack-o'-lantern. So it's really kind of got all of this um, popularized in it. Uh, the next year we get the Disney movie, uh, Donald Duck Trick or Treat. Uh, so it's captured right there in the film name, but because it's Disney now, it's safer. It's a little more whitewashed. It's a little, um, you know, friendlier, childlike and safer. So we kind of have that shifting, getting away a little bit from mischief. Uh, and then also kind of in this time, we have the sense of charity coming back. So not necessarily uh, saying prayers for loved ones, but trick-or-treating for UNICEF uh, became a thing in 1950 in Pennsylvania and it's just been gaining ground ever since then. So uh, you still might uh, see that as, um, as an offering at Halloween time. Yeah, I used to do this as a kid. Oh, did you really? Well, was it like a little box, or how did how did that uh, work out? It was a it was a little box. I think at one point they encouraged us to go the day before or the day after, but it wasn't well received generally. <laughs> yeah, I kind but, of yeah, I vaguely remember it. I think, but um, yeah, it's it's still it's still a thing, and again, it kind of goes back to that idea of of charity and getting, you know, getting something in return for, you know, for giving a reward. Uh, yeah, and, and people are commenting that they also trick-or-treated in the 70s as well. So again, it's, it's been a long, um, long-standing area. Okay, and yeah, and they were said it was well-received, you know, getting nickels and dimes and quarters. So it was a way to receive uh, money that way. Excellent. Um, and let me see here. Okay, uh, so then kind of the last tradition that I'll talk about, and we kind of saw little snippets of it and some of the images that I showed you was this idea of pumpkin carving. Uh, so again, how many of you are carving pumpkins or have carved pumpkins? Uh, my favorite thing of pumpkin carving is the pumpkin seeds. So that's one of the main reasons that I do it. Um, but the idea of pumpkin carving really goes back to this idea of the legend of jack-o'-lantern or jack of the lantern and this was an irish myth again coming over from the immigration uh, starting in the 19th century and it was 
regarding a man named Stingy Jack, who had made a deal with the devil at a bar. <laughs> Jack, and there's a couple of variations of this, but essentially Jack tricked the devil. And so when Jack died, he was, of course, too bad to go to heaven. And the devil was not going to let him into hell after he was tricked by Jack. Um, but the devil did have pity on him. So he took a burning ember of coal from hell and he gave it to Jack, who placed it into a carved turnip. And so you see Jack now doomed to wander the earth too bad for heaven um and you know too too mischievous for a hell uh to go anywhere other than wandering the earth and so again it was originally called jack of the lantern he had a, a lantern uh, of a turnip which was then shortened to our jack-o-lantern uh, but because pumpkins were so much more prevalent and native to America, and let's face it, easier to carve, <laughs> they, uh, the Irish tradition soon uh, took over uh, from turnips and parsnips to pumpkins. So that's why we have our pumpkin carving tradition. And the carving of the face can really represent two things in a similar way that the bonfire or either mask is both meant to protect you and to ward away evil spirits. So the carving of the faces into the jack-o'-lantern is meant to either imitate Jack's face kind of as a, you know, kind of as a mockery that he would be silly enough to make a deal with the devil, um, but also to make a scary face in an attempt to, again, scare away Jack or scare away evil spirits uh, from your house. And so, again, that's why another reason why a lot of times you see the jack-o'-lantern on the front porch or by the front door or by windows to kind of protect that perimeter of your house. You might also see reference to what's called the will of the wisp. Uh, in regard to jack-o'-lanterns. Uh, and this again is based on Irish, but also English and other uh, continental European folklore. And the will of the wisp is really um, an atmospheric or natural phenomenon where gases are coming off of marshes and swamps with decaying organic matter. And they're mixing with, um, you know, the, the air and the oxygen, and they're creating little atmospheric ghost lights. And you can see them in the distance. And so people, you know, kind of, as, you know, attribute otherworldly uh, phenomena to this, or sometimes they see it in the distance and they associate that with with Jack. Um, and so that actually brings us to the end of our quick brief run through uh, the evolution of Halloween into what we do today and other practices. Uh, again, we just scratched the surface of it, but I wanted to have Sterling talk for a few minutes um, about his store and uh, again about some of the, the practices the practitioners uh, that come into your store and kind of just, you know, what you're able to provide and uh, kind of just kind of see what some of the uh, traditions that we've talked about uh, in this lecture kind of you see day in and day out at your store. Oh, thanks. Uh, it's a good picture, um, definitely. Um, and uh, right in the background there is my son, Jack. That's where your just, face getting, <laughs> so. just getting home now so you may hear some noise in the background including our dogs which have not been fed um otherwise it, it's totally quiet in my house for the whole time of course um but our our store uh is on the corner of um uh a street and main street hello jack just talking hey, about you really yeah uh, you just happen to be in this picture here in the background. And we were talking about jack-o'-lanterns and uh, their history. Mm -hmm. Oh, there mm -hmm. I am. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we uh, actually chose his name because it's uh, a great old uh, uh, pagan name, if you will. Um, uh, so sort of the original uh, masculine, if you will. But there's a, has a lot of names and a lot of meanings. It shows up in a lot of places like uh, Jack Frost, um, Jack of the Green, which is like the, the green man, the connection to nature. Um, but our, uh, our, our stores um, in the historic uh, district of Laurel, um, and uh, it's sort of 
came out of um, uh, partly, certainly, love of the craft. Um, and uh, so there are a lot of little things incorporated into it. Um, so uh, this year we haven't done uh, too much uh, decorations, though, I must say. We've been so busy that uh, it's been very hard to uh, uh, decorate for, for this holiday. Um, but um, yeah, uh, there are a, a number of things which are traditional this time of year, uh, such as uh, reading cards uh, or divination. Um, there are certainly uh, divinations that come out of the Bible, um, which may be good to do this time of year. One of which would be to take a Bible and you know, open it up and drop a pin on a page uh, and uh, read the verse there. Uh, we call that a um, bibliomancy. Um, there are others certainly with uh, uh, cards and uh, sort of the reflection of the moon, um, which you could do in a body of water or a cauldron. Uh, sometimes we would uh, toss a silver coin in a cauldron um, uh, for that reflection, that divination. Um, it is a time when the veil of the world is considered thin. It is a, a time to remember those that have passed, maybe not just this year, but in previous years. So a lot of times people will honor their, their ancestors, their um, fathers and their mothers that, that may no longer be with us or uh, parents, uh, grandparents that have passed, um, but also certainly are those that are living as well. Um, honor the time that they have while they're here in this world. Uh, hmm. Uh, certainly, it is a good time to uh, enjoy candy if you like, uh, but don't feel bad if you don't like candy. Uh, traditionally, um, uh, treats, um, certainly food of this season, um, sometimes cloven fruit, uh, like uh, a fruit that you may um, poke cloves into. Um, but there are certainly a lot of others, uh, some of which those ancient recipes may not be very um, sweet, um, a lot of breads and cakes, uh, but some of them are actually pretty tasty if, if you're able to sort of look them up on the internet and try them. Um, so uh, usually most of our holidays are punctuated by food of the season. So food, local food, food of the land, uh, you know, supporting your local farmers, absolutely. And uh, as a reminder, the day after sort of, um, of October 31st, or once we kind of sort of pass the cusp of the holiday, if you will, it is a time of, of reincarnation. So we talked a little bit about that um, with All Saints Day, uh, All Souls Day, uh, but it is a time also of where life begins again, although we're at the end of a cycle we are also starting uh, another cycle. So, and, uh, so there is sort of a, an upbeat note, I'd say at the end of it. That's about all I have. <laughs> okay, yeah, Sterling, that's wonderful. And certainly if anyone has any specific questions, we still have a few minutes for that. Um, Sterling, there, how can they, they, you have an online store, right? And if they are in Laurel, Maryland, they can come, what, you're open seven days a week? Uh, we are, we're open uh, seven days a week. Um, yep. Uh, I mean, we are closed in some holidays, uh, mm -hmm. but otherwise we're open. I think we only closed really for December 25th, and Thanksgiving day. That might, that might be all, um, but, yeah, um, and if there's any changes, usually Google has got the right uh, hours uh, and uh, good reasonable directions. Okay, excellent. Um, uh, Salem was just a, probably a point where um, Salem witch trials occurred. Um, certainly a lot's been uh, written, said, and done um, about them. 
Um, but it does, I'd say that Salem is, is a point where uh, a lot of people like to go to for Halloween. So if you want to avoid crowds, I would avoid Salem, Massachusetts this time of year. There are so many people up there. It's um, the traffic is uh, quite congested. So um, yeah, it is a time where effigies were burned. Generally, um, we would uh, burn away that which uh, we either have no use for anymore, or if we're burning sort of an effigy of ourself, we are sort of getting rid of that which we don't, you know, want or like about ourselves. So we would use that as a point of sort of self-improvement, if you will. So uh, there is a large Wicca community almost everywhere, but certainly in, in Laurel, but um, Frederick and Salem and pretty much everywhere, um, maybe more visible in urban areas, but there's a lot of people out in the country that just, you know, look very normal, but um, they're certainly uh, full on involved in, in witchcraft. A, a lot of uh, our tradition is, is based in nature. So I think being in nature, being rural, it can be very positive, I think. But, Certainly, uh, you can find uh, spirituality anywhere, I hope, but uh, certainly in nature, uh, maybe a lot of people would prefer it, you know, just, you know, a, li a little closer to uh, the earth. Great. Um, well, I am going to just move on with a few announcements. Again, if you have other questions or comments, please uh, put them in. But I just wanted to just uh, kind of remind people who are local and um, for those of you who are not, uh, just to tell you a little bit about Laurel and our museum. Uh, so we are open to the public uh, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays from 12 to 4 uh, through the end of the year. Uh, it's free admission. We are a small community museum and archive, like I mentioned before. And Laurel is located in between DC and Baltimore. So we really have uh, a lot to tell in terms of transportation, the history of the river. Uh, there is a lot of nature and beauty um, that you know, is, is where Laurel is located. Uh, so I encourage you to stop by the museum if you're in the area. Uh, and if you're not, we have a lot available online. We have our collections, we have past exhibits online, uh, and we also have recordings of uh, previous webinars and some uh, tours of our exhibit online as well. So also uh, we have a couple uh, other uh, activities coming up. We're gonna have uh, Children's Day at the museum uh, next month on November 14th. Again, that's a free event, uh, but we are hoping to, again, celebrate the harvest uh, in different ways and also celebrate Native American month uh, as well. And then we have two other webinars. If you're interested, I'm gonna put the information here the chat before I talk too much and forget to include it again. Uh, in November, we're going to be uh, having a speaker from Montgomery History, which is um, just kind of over a little bit from Laurel, uh, Laurel, Maryland. Another fun fact uh, for you tonight is actually located in four different counties in Maryland, and Montgomery is one of them. And so we're going to be having a speaker from their speaker series uh, talking about a uh, feminist commune. And so there's really going to be history. Uh, there's going to be women's history, suffrage history. Uh, it's going to be really fascinating about uh, this commune that's really so close to Laurel. Uh, and then at, toward the end of the year, we're going to be talking about the history of uh, Christmas trees in Laurel. And if you're from the area, you probably have heard or have pictures or stories of the Clifton family uh, Christmas tree, which is not here anymore. Um, but we have lots of pictures and stories about it. So we'll be talking about that toward the end of the year. Uh, and again, I, I put it in the chat previously uh, that if you want to support the Laurel Historical Society so that we can keep giving uh, free admission and free summer camps, uh, you know, free webinars, uh, we do have a spot where you can either join or donate. Uh, and you can also just donate a couple dollars to support the presentation tonight. So if you can click on that link just a little further up in the chat, uh, that would be uh, a really great way to support us. And again, if you are in the area, uh, you can stop down at one end of Main Street and see Sterling and the Crystal Box, uh, and then hike up a couple blocks uh, and see the Laurel Museum if you are in town. 
And here is uh, our contact information. Uh, again, Sterling and the Crystal Fox are online, also on um, Facebook as well. So if you have any questions, please feel free to follow up with me if there's something you need to clarify or uh, if there's additional resources that you need, um, please let me know. You can uh, call, email, and we invite you to connect with us on Facebook. Uh, just in closing, uh, there were some comments again about uh, the myths of uh, the, the razor, blade, razor blades in the candy apples and things like that. And so there are a couple of resources um, that I've used. One is uh, Death Makes a Holiday, which is a cultural history of Halloween, uh, is a good resource. Uh, anything by uh, Lisa Morton, this one is Trick or Treat. This is kind of really the definitive history of Halloween. Um, and I didn't pull it from my bookshelf, but there was actually a history of Halloween written by Ruth Kelly uh, in the early 1900s that is really good at capturing the early history of Halloween along with so many um, literary aspects of it, all, all the kinds of poems and songs and minstrels uh, about Halloween. So if you're interested in that, um, I encourage you to, to look those up online. Thank you to everyone who's uh, to, to stuck around tonight to hear me uh, talk about Halloween. And thanks to Sterling so much for uh, a great presentation, uh, a great perspective on this time of the year. Uh, and again, if there's any other questions, I'm going to stick around in the chat for a little bit. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording right now, but I will still be on the webinar for just a few more minutes. So thanks again, everyone. Have uh, a great and blessed evening and night. And we will. We'll uh, see everyone hopefully in Laurel soon.